Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the next session this morning with Breed O'Sullivan, the Department Manager in Corporate Strategy and Planning and IDA, alongside the journalist and broadcaster Tommy Gorman. Tommy retired from RTE in 2021 after over 40 years reporting from the Northwest, from Brussels, and from Belfast, making him the perfect person to join Breda for this session, which is focused on looking forward Ireland and its neighbours in 2023. So, Breda, I'll pass over to you. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, Tommy, I'm absolutely delighted to have you here today, as I'm sure everybody else is. I think you've been a, a very calming presence on our screen for many, many years. Um, bearing witness to many of the big historic moments on this island and indeed in Europe. You've seen huge changes over your career in Ireland economically and socially. You've borne, massive you've borne witness to huge changes in the media sector as well in terms of technology. You've sat down with the great and good, reporting on the biggest stories of the time from Brexit to Roy Keane leaving Saipan. Um, unfortunately, we only have half an hour today. So I might like to start maybe with some of the changes you've witnessed in Ireland. So I believe you started your career in the Western Journal back in 1977, if I'm right, and spent the next number of years working in the West and the Northwest. So I suppose looking back at that time, it seems like there was huge change in the air. It seems very obvious to us now that Ireland was starting to change back then. But I wonder at the time, was that sense of change there economically, especially given that we just recently joined the EU? Firstly, it's lovely to be looking at live people. Um, <laughs> I was at the back of the hall listening to the presentation by your chair and by your CEO, and I was noticing the age profile of the organization. So you can see uh, the churn that's going on there uh, and an organization fit for purpose. So. It's great to be at the equivalent of a family wedding after um, <laughs> all that lengthy period of uh, video calls and Skyping and so on. It's lovely to feel the energy of real people again, and hopefully we'll give some of that energy back. Um, in terms of my career, I was reflecting on it in a piece in the currency at the weekend. Um, the big changes that took place, like free second level education had just started when, when I was going into secondary school, but also the planning had, was in place for the regional technical colleges. Uh, and I think that dovetailed perfectly uh, with joining the European Union. And um, it's interesting in this very month when we're celebrating 50 years of EU membership, uh, I feel that was the real game changer in terms of Ireland's advancement. There was good infrastructure there in terms of the preparations that were starting at educational level. And in my home, I'm from the Northwest, I'm from Sligo, and in my hometown, our office in RTE is actually uh, based in the uh, Finisterland Industrial Estate in Sligo. So Eamon Howley, who was the IDA's regional manager at the time, and his colleagues like Tom Corker and Lord Reston, I saw what they were attempting to do in my town, and just a fascinating story. One of the first industries that came to Sligo was an Italian company called uh, Snia. Uh, they were synthetic fiber manufacturers, and they went to Hazelwood House. And then I actually went on the trip with the uh, CEO of, of the IDA at the time, Porik White, to Sehan in South Korea, uh, and they brought back a videotape manufacturing company, and that replaced Sehan. And just now, a major company called Sazerac has bought that empty site where there was no activity going on, and they're about to start manufacturing paddy whiskey. They're going to move the manufacture of paddy from south up to the northwest, and they're hoping that it will become as successful as Bushmills, as a visitor center or as the Guinness Hop Store. And it's interesting that I've seen three facets of industry, uh, all with IDA support, uh, all part of the changing landscape of my home place. Mm. And what do you think the magic ingredients are there to keep being able to, to make those changes? I think our CEO and chairman have spoken about in their speeches this morning the choppy waters that are ahead, and I suppose we've seen a lot of choppy waters in the past too. But how do we keep making those changes? How do you maintain that flexible attitude? You have to try to stay smart. 
Uh, you have to stay engaged. You can't rest on your laurels. Like in some ways, when you look at, I was watching the, the, the presentation of the stats, and you look at the way FDI has worked. Like I was in Brussels during the years when the corporation tax regime was negotiated. And there was this feeling from other member states that Ireland can only absorb so much. Uh, like it's, it's a small island behind a larger island. Uh, so there wasn't huge fear uh, about our very competitive, our short corner corporation tax arrangements because of our actual size. But we have maximized that. But just looking at those presentations and hearing Mary talk about the choppy waters ahead, she doesn't say that out of fear, I'm sure. She just says it out of realism. So the reality is change is constant. Uh, change in my industry is an example of it in, in media. So change is always going to be with us. And the day you start resting on your laurels, or the day you let fear motivate your strategy, well, then you're finished. You just got to stay smart and get lucky. You need to be lucky. And I think that's one of the things that I can notice about, say, what has happened in Ireland. Like the gambles that the IDA took in terms of on tech, on pharma, like we have Abbott and Sligo for all my life. Uh, and you haven't backed many turkeys, really. Uh, so you just have to hope that you stay lucky and you stay smart. Uh, but it's the old story is if, if you're up early in the morning and if you're ready for work, well, then you've got a better chance. Yeah. And it's interesting what you're saying there about the changes in technology in the media sector as well, because I think, you know, it's, it's almost unrecognizable probably from when you started out. It really struck me when I was reading your book, when you're reporting on the Dan Tidy case from Leitrim, that your wife had to run to a phone box to ring Dublin to tell them that the story was breaking. When you look at that versus where we are now, what are the kind of challenges it's thrown up, or is the job still the same? Oh, the immediacy of everything is, is wonderful. Um, the biggest change I, I saw in my lifetime, when I would say working in somewhere like Brussels, once you had a story, the next thing you had to do was get to a place where you could edit it and send it back. And in those days, if you'd go to a place in Madrid or in Rome or in Lisbon, you'd pay 500 euro for a 15-minute slot to send back your material. Nowadays, there's a machine called a Live View, invented by the Israelis. Who else would be in the... Yeah, to the forefront of smart technology in that sector, but the Israelis. So with the live view, it would fit in, in a handbag. It's a small little unit, and they use SIMs, the same SIM that you and I use on our mobile phones. And with a combination of four to six SIMs, you can send back pristine television pictures from anywhere in the world. And that, that's the biggest dramatic change I've seen. So like, when I watch Tony Connolly or Sean Whelan or any reporter who's out in the field now, I know they have with them this small little bit of equipment, and it actually replaces satellite vans. It's as dramatic as that. So effectively, it means that you can get pictures from anywhere at any time cheaply. And I suppose the other change we all saw coming, if you think of, say, the earthquake pictures that we saw from places like Japan, um, you remember the first pictures were shaky pictures because they were being taken by workers in their workplace. Everyone is a journalist now, and like, here's proof of it. Here you are doing the interviews. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you know, Claire Byrne. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'll give her a run for her money. And I suppose the downside of that is you have to be careful too because there's a camera everywhere, and if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, you're going to be caught. Yeah. Uh, so you have to be aware of that too. Yeah. That everyone is a journalist nowadays. That's the world we live in. Um, changing tack a little bit then, I suppose, you know, I think you're synonymous with an awful lot of people of my age with reporting on Northern Ireland. You were there right through the negotiations around the Good Friday Agreement and how that has worked out thereafter. Um, I suppose in terms of it, you know, you were talking to the key players do you think it delivered what the signatories expected of it? And has it worked out in kind of unusual ways, do you think? Um, I, I'm a glass half full person for many reasons. Um, I just think it's a great privilege to be alive. Every day it's a privilege to be alive. Uh, and just like, say, with, with the IDA, 
I think you have to give thanks for the miracle of the calls you made in terms of FDI and the way the corporation tax has worked in your favor. Uh, the very same thing with Northern Ireland. We should never take for granted the greatest miracle of all, that the killing has stopped, that you know the reality we woke up with every day and the sense of helplessness and shame we felt in the taking of life that was going on day after day, week after week. Politics has actually delivered in bringing the killing to an end. And we should never, ever take that for granted. Now we're into the second phase, and it's the messy phase. It's where do you go after that? And, you know, there's no doubt about it that Brexit complicated matters greatly. And we're foolish if we try to ignore that reality. But I think you're in for a fascinating time now. Like at this conference, you'll have Simon Coveney, Minister for Enterprise. You'll have Leo Varadkar, Taoiseach. And as we speak, Michal Martin, the Taunished and Minister for Foreign Affairs, is over in Brussels, uh, meeting with the European Commission, just getting an update on where discussions are at around Brexit. So I think those three players, Simon Coveney, ex-Foreign Minister with a huge interest in trade, Leo Varadkar, Taoiseach, former Taunishta, Michal Martin, Minister for Foreign Affairs, I think in the next three months, just watch the space, watch to see if they're going to be able to deliver or to assist in the delivery of some sort of a compromise that would get uh, a settlement of sorts, a political settlement of sorts in place around Brexit to allow for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. That's sort of the big picture of political question that's there. And the days are gone when you and I can say, oh, that's that place up there, that's Northern Ireland. That's absolute nonsense anymore. Because if, as IDA people, you sometimes compete uh, with uh, Invest Northern Ireland, you're very aware of that corridor from Belfast to Newry to Louth, uh, down to Dublin. You're deeply conscious of what's happening in Derry uh, and in Letterkenny. Uh, you're probably aware of that black hole that exists as you come around Fermanagh, Sligo, Leitrim, Cavan, Monaghan, uh, Armagh, and the way your people are under pressure to bring proper investment, long-term investment there. So this whole question of the future of the island economy, whether it's a united Ireland or a shared island, that's part of the thinking. That's going to have to be part of IDA strategizing for the next 5, 10, 15 years, because it's a ticking, it's a ticking clock. It's not a ticking time bomb, but it's present and it's, it's very much alive. And I suppose to follow on to that a little bit then, where do you think the debate about Irish unity is heading and what do you think the consequences of that will be, um, even the debate about it? Um, it's great to be alive at this time as an Irish person um, because we've had the centenary of the creation of our state we have the impasse over Brexit. You know the realities that, say for instance, if you're a milk producer, if you're in the dairy sector in a border area, you know the way it's a porous border. You know the way the single market has worked for us. You know the value of cooperation. You know the seamless way you can cross the border. So that has changed dramatically in our, in our lifetime. Um, it's also true that Sinn Féin is the most popular party uh, on the uh, south of the border um, that is pushing uh, to copper fasten that position and to make a place in government in the next general election. That debate is out there. The United Ireland debate is out there. These are questions that are going to be addressed. Uh, so I think that debate is moving. I don't think it's in any way settled. Um, and if I could, just maybe, say a brief word about unionism because one of the one of the most satisfying part of my work in, in Northern Ireland was to get to try to understand unionism like I'm a southern catholic from Sligo and to be able to do my job effectively you had to get the trust of people who were from a completely different tradition so unionism is in it's in a a very, very challenging place. Uh, no longer the largest party in Stormont. Um, 
not having the same heft with a Conservative Party that's struggling at the moment and that may or may not be in the last phase of its current uh, time in power. Uh, so it's, it's a challenging time for unionism. Um, but my experience of watching unionists in action is if you can get their trust, um, the chemistry changes. So I think that's going to be part of the ongoing challenge uh, because you can't deny the uh, United Ireland debate is out there. You can't deny there's an interdependence factor in the way the island works, that it's in all our interest if the island works. So just like the challenges facing the IDA, like there's nothing to be afraid of, uh, but it's there and it mm -hmm. needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe referring back to Brexit a little bit now, we know that it's unleashed some very challenging dilemmas for the islands, for you know, Britain as much as Ireland, obviously. I know from your book, you worked with Boris Johnson in Europe in the 1990s, and you talk about that strain of Euroscepticism that was sort of always there, but it started to come more and more to the fore. So I guess, how do you see that working out in the UK? These are all the hard questions here today now. How do you see that working out within the Conservative Party? Because they seem to have par painted themselves into a corner with it. Yeah, I think, um, I think Brexit was a mistake. Uh, I think it was pushed by English nationalism. I understand where it came from. Like, our journey was completely different. We were dying for the gig to get out from behind the larger island and to get onto the European stage. We were, you know, just gagging for that opportunity to benchmark ourselves and to show what we could do on the wider stage. With Britain, it was a completely different process. This was an empire in decline. Um, and they had that long history of being a bigger power. So while we were going that way, they were heading the opposite direction. So you can understand uh, in some respects where the uh, instincts of the Eurosceptics came from. I think the tragedy um, in, in their miscalculation was they didn't realize the value of what they had done in terms of Northern Ireland. Like Northern Ireland is like the old space in the intersecting sets. It's that place where people could be British and Irish and where everybody was European. Uh, and I, I feel that they didn't understand, really, the unravelling that was going to take place there and that the only land border they would have would be on the island of Ireland. But that said, um, I think there's tremendous... And your people who work in, in Britain will know this. Like, you turn on Radio 4, you turn on BBC, you turn on ITV, you look at any showbiz personality, you look at any football team on any one day, and there's an Irish route there. Like, we have huge connections, people-to-people -people connections, and I think they'll survive. Um, the Conservatives, I'm not sure. Um, their government at the moment, new Prime Minister doing his best, they're struggling to be coherent. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting to watch Keir Starmer. He's almost holding back to the stage where he's staying away from anything that's controversial, because I'm sure the advice to him is, if you say nothing, this is going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't get drawn into a, a scrap, and that seems to be the case. So from an Irish perspective, looking at our nearest neighbours, I think we just have to see how that unfolds. But I think the people-to-people -people relationship will survive. And like, it's such an important trading partner for us, uh, and indeed, we're an important trading partner for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that wasn't fully understood um, and we, I don't think, grasped it when we joined the European Union, was how well we were going to get on around the European table. Um, my best friends when I was in Brussels, a lot of my best friends were, were British journalists. It, you know, it surprised me by how much I had in common with them. Uh, and those friendships remain. Boris Johnson was one of them. Uh, we were colleagues. Um, he was great crack. Uh, <laughs> he was very, very talented. Um, but I would never fully believe his stories. I'd always check them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good advice, I think. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the North, the Northern Ireland and Ireland and the UK, but actually, you know, Brexit is a huge challenge for Europe as well. And it's just one of many interlocking challenges I think that Europe is facing. You know, there's war in the East, 
energy crises, migration crises as well. So how do you see the EU developing and changing in the face of these challenges? And do you think it has that adaptability and flexibility there to be able to continue to be a net positive in the world, not just for the, uh, uh, the islands, but for the world, you know? Um, I'm not sure. Like, when we joined it, there were six countries when we joined in uh, 73, and we brought it up to nine. And for some of those years, in particular, say, the years when, like, we were getting for every euro or pound we contributed to the EU kitty, we were getting back four or five. It was a great arrangement. Uh, and we absorbed that money and we used it well. You'll remember the European flags and the gold stars that you'd see everywhere. And we had a, we had a capacity. It was one of our successes that we were able to absorb it and put it to use. So it went from being uh, a delicatessen to being a sort of a soulless supermarket. Um, and if you look at, say, the numbers queuing up to join, uh, you look at the way uh, Russia has reacted to the expansion of NATO uh, and of, say, the EU influence. You look at the new relationship that's been forged between Russia and China, and you wonder what's India doing there. And you see the geopolitics are changing dramatically. But they're the realities. So, as a member state, we have our place around that table. It's not that we've got associate membership. We're there by entitlement, we're there by right. So really, what we have to do is we have to be sharp, we have to participate, we have to influence, and we have to use our experience. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're in the club, um, and the club is challenged, uh, and it's facing into territories that it didn't anticipate you know, COVID is an example. The war in Ukraine is a huge example and how that's affecting our economy. But there are the realities that mm -hmm. you, you just have to, you have to deal with. And I think maybe an interesting one for Ireland as well is losing the UK from Europe means that we maybe have to step up a little bit more. So when you're talking about you do natural affinity with the UK journalists, I think potentially the Irish civil service had a natural affinity with the UK civil service as yeah, well. Yeah, but, but on the other hand, for... Your colleagues, it must be a huge example, or a huge advantage rather, that when you're going out pitching for industries, for you to be able to say, well, look, we are a well-educated, English-speaking, uh, open economy with guaranteed access to the European Union. Like, how Britain gave up that right. The Scots would kill for it. The Welsh would kill for it. Birmingham would kill for it. Uh, Newcastle would kill for it. Liverpool would kill for it. So that's a huge advantage for us. I also think that because of that people-to-people -people relationship, there is the opportunity for us to be a useful friend at court for our nearest neighbour. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that's how things might develop. Yeah. Very interesting. And if you don't mind now, I might move to a slightly different tack, more into the personal side of things. So I know in your book you talk with tremendous love and respect about your family, uh, your wife, Kira, and your children, Moya and Joe. And I think Joe works for our sister agency, Enterprise Ireland. Yeah, Joe has just finished up his two year stint with uh, Enterprise Ireland in, in Boston. Uh, had a great time over there. Very good. And. Uh, just asking then, how did you balance your family life with the very demanding career that you've had and all the moves and changes over time? Um, they were very understanding. Um, they knew that I loved my work, and I hope they knew that I loved them. Uh, so there was no conflict there. Um, I remember once uh, coming home, uh, and Kira and the, the Joe and Moya were very young at the time, and I just got in to, to we live near Strand Hill in Sligo, and I was just in the door, and Concord had crashed in Paris, and they were on the phone to me, wondering would I go back. So, I had a suitcase, I hadn't got in the door, but I gave them the vote on it, you know? And they all voted that I'd go. Um, mm. 
And it wasn't out of, you know, get out to hell, we don't want to see you. <laughs> uh, I hope anyway. But I think they knew that I had a responsible job and that I loved the job. So we, we worked it around that. Um, but yeah, it, there, was, there was never a, a conflict. Like they knew that they were my life and my job was my life as well. Like my job was, you couldn't in the job I was in, you wouldn't want to be in a job that was nine to five because generally the most exciting things happened outside of the working day. Mm -hmm. Like the beautiful thing about news is if the call goes in the middle of the night, you know it's a story. And if you're interested in the story, well then that's it. So they were, they were very, very understanding about that. But um, they were both born in Brussels and our daughter Moya is back in the town where she was born. She works as a translator with the European Council. So that sort of influenced her life as well. And I think my son's interest in travel and in seeing the bigger picture, I think that comes from the life that I lived. So they were probably raised as Europeans as well as Irish, really. Yeah. 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 Aren't we all? Aren't we? But that's true, certainly. Like the IDA wouldn't be able to do much if it didn't see itself as being part of that European picture. Like uh, FDI it wouldn't be happening if, you, if we didn't have that European Union membership. No, absolutely. Um, and our, the charity partner for IDA this year is actually the Irish Cancer Society. And I know you have a very long experience with the disease. I think the, your share, you sharing your story was very instrumental in terms of improving cancer services in Ireland and also getting Irish people access to treatments in other countries. And I was just wondering, for you and your family, was it a difficult decision to share your diagnosis? I know when you did it at the time, it probably wasn't something that people did so commonly. Well, Kira is, is more private than I am, uh, and I, I respect that. And the only time um, when I, I felt bad about being public about my own situation was uh, I was walking in the street with Joe when he was about two or three, uh, and this woman came up and says, are you the fellow with the cancer? Oh, uh, and I could feel his little hand just squeezing. That was the only time. Um, but most of the time, uh, the knowledge that I got, say, for instance, to be able to access treatment abroad, that came from actually reporting on a decision in the court of justice and finding out about the E112 system. And it was by being able to access that system that I was able to travel to Sweden for treatment that wasn't available in Ireland. Uh, so that was wonderful. And since then, I've got a, a condition called neuroendocrine tumours. It's the disease that kills Steve Jobs. Um, they're hormone-producing tumours. So I've had a dodgy liver since 1994. Uh, but as a result of, say, the experience we had in, in Sweden, and meeting other patients there, we were able to work within the Irish system to establish a centre of excellence at St Vincent's in Dublin. So what we do now um, is if there are one or two procedures that are still not available here, so we send our patients abroad uh, for that and they're able to access that. And again, that's, you know, if you're sending somebody to America, if ever you hear of somebody who's going to America for healthcare, they're going to need an awful lot of money because you've got to pay for it. But the wonderful thing about, say, the cross-border directive, uh, or the E11, E111 system, or the E112 system, these are ours by right because of our European citizenship. So that's, that's another reason why I'm very thankful to being a European citizen, because that status actually helped me to get access to treatment that keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. um, that cross-border directive uh, was introduced by the Irish Commissioner at the time. He was in charge of the health portfolio, David Byrne, a former Attorney General. And it's gas to be down here uh, in, uh, in Kerry because the Healy Rays and there's a TD, Michael Collins in Cork, they're sending up busloads of patients from this region to Northern Ireland to get cataract surgery in a clinic on the outskirts of Belfast. And they're availing of that E112, of that cross-border directive mechanism. And you can use it for public patients who need hip replacements in France or Spain or the Czech Republic or Poland. It's like 
one of the secrets of the Irish Health Service. So if you know of anybody who's on a waiting list and who's a public patient who hasn't got, I think 45, 50% of us have private health insurance. But if you know of anybody who's caught in the system, who's a public patient and stuck on a waiting list, that mechanism is there for them. The cross-border directive operated by the HSE from Kilkenny, uh, and it's just marvellous. That's great. Tommy, unfortunately, we're starting to run out of time here. I think I could sit here talking to you all day, and I'm sure everyone would love to sit here listening to you all day as well. But just on behalf of IDA, thank you so much for taking the time to come down from Sligo to speak with us in person here today. It's been a real pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure to meet you. I hope you weren't too nervous. Uh, <laughs> uh, ch changing roles. I wouldn't be able to do your job. Oh, you'd um, be surprised. And, um, <laughs> I would. Uh, 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 and I know the biggest job you do is you have three little ones, you know, uh, and that's a big job too. <laughs> yeah. uh, but good luck to everybody. Um, the statistics were interesting, and I love the way uh, your CEO had the velvet love approach, talking about the difficult times ahead, a bit of sobriety. I thought it was very, very interesting. Uh, very, very good strategy. So well done. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks so much.